Uh, so I want to uh, begin by also, uh, of course, thanking Anne and the League for the award. Uh, I'm honored to be a recipient and to join the other winners, um, many of whom are close friends, uh, all of whom are very respected colleagues. Uh, I also owe thanks um, to the New University of Michigan and Dean Monica Ponce de Leon as well for support of the project in the gallery and also to one of my employees, Justin Gross, who was instrumental in um, uh, executing the project. The title of my talk is Sugar Cubes and Moon Rocks. Um, it's organized in three episodes, which I'm hoping will assure uh, a comfortable pace, but also reflects how I organize my teaching design and writing around larger sets of ideas. Um, the three episodes are On Form Revisited, uh, Compound Attention, and New Natures. And these roughly uh, correspond to the categories of aesthetics, experience, and ontology. So the first episode, uh, of course, refers to the art discourse um, surrounding Georges Bataille's notion of the en form or formless, which, as many of you know, was the inspiration for an exhibition at the Pompidou in 1996, curated by Rosalind Krauss and Yves Alambois. Um, this has been a long-standing aesthetic interest of mine, mainly due to the rough and uh, dirty qualities of the objects included in the show which I found to be a provocative alternative to the smooth, glossy white aesthetic of most digital work common in the 2000s, which was the time frame of my uh, graduate studies and also when I first became interested in the OM form. As I looked deeper into the ideas surrounding the show, however, I became less interested in the OM form as an aesthetic category and more as a process driven by a particular kind of creative impulse. Uh, this is a distinction that comes straight from Bataille, who defined the formless not as a category, nor a concept, nor a material substance, but as an operation, a downward movement or slippage from the high to the low, or from the pure to the profane. Uh, as it pertains to matter and materiality, the Omphorn defines what Bois and Krauss call base materialism, which differs from other forms of materialism, such as dialectical, which Bataille criticized for fetishizing and ontologizing matter. According to Bataille, uh, dialectical materialists wrongfully, quote, situated dead matter at the summit of a conventional hierarchy of diverse types of facts, without realizing that in this way they have submitted to an obsession with an ideal form of matter. The kinds of matter that interested Bataille were things like madness, human excrement, or other obscenities, the seductive forms of waste that appeal to our most infantile side. According to Bois and Krauss, this base materialism was at the heart of a number of practices excluded from the modernist canon. Uh, from a standpoint of making, much of this work is unique in the way that it, it expresses matter directly. For example, the dirt in Rauschenberg's dirt painting is not a depiction of dirt, it's just dirt. Other works created by, were created by altering materials through heat or other acts of deformation, disrupting the logic of the image by collapsing the distinction between form and matter. Now, as an architect, this form of making goes against what, the way that we typically work, which is to move from abstraction to concrete things, ideas to sketches, drawings, models, and mock-ups, which is ultimately a process of adding order, uh, whether that be geometric, programmatic, or structural order, to an initially unordered idea. Um, so, in my own work, I've played out this creative impulse in a series of um, small-scale installations and objects that all began with some initial material stock uh, that were then deformed, altered, or articulated through custom techniques. So this is just a sampling of some of my students' work, um, some installations that I did. Um, and then I'll spend a minute on this project, Hover, which was an installation, uh, a collaboration with composer Ashley Fury, uh, my sister, who's a brilliant young composer uh, in here tonight. Um, unfortunately, I'm not going to talk about the sonic uh, aspects of it. I'm just going to focus on the, uh, <laughs> the material aspects of it, which was a two-part system. So uh, a body of polyester batting that was um, strung around a series of steel ribs. Um, so the batting is an interesting material because it's highly manipulable. Uh, it easily creates both mass and volume. Um, you can fluff it up, rip it apart, and sculpt it. It's translucent, so you can light it from behind, and it, the whole body tends to glow. Uh, it receives color well. So in this um, installation, I apply color directly to the outside surface and then um, behind the outermost layer so that the color would sort of glow from within when uh, the project was lit. Um, 
and then you can heat it uh, to give these small kind of holes you see in the top right and it makes the skin change a little bit from soft to hard so it produces an interesting tactile uh, sensation. Um, this is a detail of the steel structure so flat ribs um, well, ribs cut flat and then looped and bolted together to produce these kind of um, uh, profiles that were all um, connected to the existing ceiling structure to produce two tunnels and then a back cave. The experience of moving through the space is this. So you move from the outside, which is less articulated, soft, white, minimal color, minimal light, and then you go into the deeper parts of it, the cave, and then you start to get um, you see the material decay, you see the material uh, mix with other materials, so organic matters get mixed in, uh, different hues of coppers and red um, are applied, um, various details of the bulbs which would form around the steel structure. Um, so all of the material qualities generated from the you know, deformation and alteration of one material. Um, so you sort of see it as a sequence, or as a kind of gradated sequence. Uh, so why does the on form have to be revisited as opposed to just referenced? Uh, the reason is that architecture does not show up positively within this discourse. In fact, architecture is one of the first victims of Bataille's polemic. In the journal Documents, which is a primary reference for Bois and Krauss, Bataille writes of architecture as the natural expression of society, a symbol of authority and power synonymous with system itself. For him, an attack on architecture was a necessary attack on the project of man. This negative sentiment persists in the more architecture-focused uh, work included in the formless exhibition from Gordon Matta Clark's um, splitting seen here. Uh, to Robert Smithson's partially buried woodshed where architecture was a literal material for entropy to destroy. Architecture remains an oppressive force to be resisted and attacked. Uh, for me, the practices within this body of work that are worth revisiting, uh, however, are not those of Smithson and Matta Clark, um, whose negative attitudes toward architecture could not be clear and cannot be saved, uh, but rather the work of someone like Lucio Fontana, whose mixing of crude materiality, color, and finish creates an interesting class of objects for architecture to consider, what I call multivalent objects. Uh, within the context of the formless um, exhibition, uh, Bois and Krauss reference three aspects of Fontana's work. First, his ability to undermine the low cultural status of kitsch by producing it without ironic distance. Uh, among other techniques, he does that by gluing fake gems to the canvas um, or painting them pink. Second, he undermines the uh, conventional superiority of form over matter um, by producing an almost obscene materiality that overwhelms form. And finally, for his, his rare polychromy, uh, especially in his early sculptural work, so the conventional understanding of this work is that color and finish were deployed by Fontana to disrupt readings of form, which is exactly why uh, color was almost universally disparaged in aesthetic theories of that time, a fact Fontana was well aware of. My interest in these sculptures, however, is not so much their transgressive nature, but rather the way in which color, finish, and materiality produce layers of articulation and multiply associations. For example, in this piece, there's the obvious presence of the figures, the lions, the materiality of the roughened clay, and then the strange insertion of pink on the back lion, uh, which indeed undermines the formal reading, but also starts to forge new associations with popular culture. So rather than a secondary disruption of a primary formal reading, I see these colorful, shiny, ill-formed objects as an example of how to combine materiality, figuration, form, and finish in such a way as to produce multivalent objects that cannot be reduced to a singular stable reading. Uh, so those early Fontana sculptures were a very direct influence on this project. This is artifacts. This was um, my contribution to the possible mediums exhibition that was um, uh, opened in January at, at the University of Michigan Liberty Gallery and also included the work of uh, three of the other winners um, of the League Prize. Um, so the project is a series of material experiments. Um, they're all nine inch cubes. Uh, there's a combination of uh, deformation of material through the application of heat and also open casting of um, concrete over um, various kinds of intricate formwork. 
Uh, and then they were all finished with different um, layers of plastic coatings, paint primers, finishing paints, um, different iridescent glazes, and then coated in resin at the end. Um, it's a list of materials underneath, just to give you a sense of the amount of articulation in it. Um, so the, uh, the idea is that the objects are full of qualities that resonate with known things, but don't have a stable reference point. Um, for example, with color, we were talking a lot about surrealist landscapes or Baroque and Rococo palettes, as opposed to more organic palettes that may have been a more obvious fit uh, for the naturalistic forms. Um, uh, as part of the formwork, there was also 3D printed sort of objects inserted into the material process, so modeled digitally to kind of mimic the material process and then inserted uh, within the flow of the material process. So um, this little guy here, the idea is that you start to scan the surface, you understand maybe it's kind of uh, in, an, in, in an indexical way how the material maybe was made, but then you see something which kind of looks like the rest of it, but also is a face kind of looking at you and you understand that there's a kind of break so that that thing can't be traced back to the material process. Um, and as Brian was starting to get at, the, the idea behind the title it comes from a twist on the definition of artifacts. So typically we understand artifacts to be the end result of some cultural process, where the physical qualities of the object can be traced back to a series of facts about its origin, where it is from, how it was made, and the time frame of its construction. These artifacts came from a what-if type of prompt, prompt, which was, can artifacts precede culture? The idea then is that the physical qualities of these objects, their idiosyncratic amalgamations of pockmarks, patinas, and profiles, do not reference a stable origin point, but perhaps enter into a pre-existing cultural field, which I understand in a Ranciere type of way to be a sensible dimension that's full of uh, aesthetic expectations and experiential conditioning, and alter it by conforming it enough to associate with known objects, but being distinct enough to redistribute, which is Ranciere's term, that sensible field. Uh, second episode is called Compound Attention. Um, it deals with experience uh, and more specifically how we as architects and designers understand the experiential dimension of our work uh, and particularly how that understanding informs our design process. Um, so my most recent thinking on this topic has been focused on this debate. This is Sylvia Levin and Hal Foster uh, at Storefront in 2011 uh, as part of the Productive Disagreement series. Um, where thinkers known to disagree are brought together to hash out their respective differences for the sake of constructive dialogue. Um, now the caricature, if you will, of this debate is that on one side you have Foster holding firmly to the position of criticality, and then on the other side you have Levin embracing an all-out turn toward affect and atmosphere. Um, I wrote a piece in the most recent issue of Project where I explain why this generalization is not altogether accurate. Uh, but for the purposes of this lecture, I'll simply state that Foster is concerned that work focused on affect and atmosphere overdetermines experience, precludes self-reflexivity, and reproduces capitalist spectacle. Uh, as an example, um, in uh, his book, The Art Architecture Complex, he describes uh, the catastrophe of minimalism, which is his phrase, uh, but how the predilections of uh, minimal art artists like Donald Jund and Dan Flavin, who favored balanced interplays uh, of material support and phenomenal effect, gave way, to, gave way to the tendencies of environmental artists such as James Turrell, um, who conceal physical artifice behind sensationalized illusions. The effects of the latter, uh, the Turrell, reverses the phenomenological principles of minimalism, which requires viewers to retain enough distance from phenomena to understand their relation to it, the reflexivity of seeing oneself See, so in the case of Flavin, he exposes the artifice or the armature which produces the phenomena, and uh, Terrell on your right um, uh, conceals the, the armature and just produces um, the kind of effect. The ultimate result of contemporary art, and by extension architecture, which is preoccupied with atmosphere or affect, is a kind of stunned spectatorship, where individuals are no longer aware of what is making them feel or perceive a certain way. They simply soak it up like a sponge. So um, in my own work, uh, I began thinking about uh, Foster's critique uh, and wondering if there's a way to approach intensive and immersive experience, which is very much a part of my work, without it becoming totalizing. So this is a 
project um, done in collaboration with Ellie Abrams of Edo. Um, it was an entry into last summer's um, BAFO competition uh, for the Linda Farrell pop-up store. Um, it's a series of two-way mirrors, which are angu like arrayed in an angular way uh, inside of uh, a contained space, and then a series of objects uh, both present in the space and then concealed behind um, semi-transparent uh, mirrors. This is the plan, which you probably can't see that well, but there's two kinks here, 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 and here, two kinks on each side, objects behind, um, which are like holding more uh, expensive uh, frames and then objects inside of this space. Um, so the way that the two-way mirror works is you can see both ways and it all depends on whether or not it's brighter on the opposite side or on the close side. So we were playing with, with uh, that capacity. These are the objects. Um, they are, we're calling them moon rocks for a pet name. They're um, foam treated with a whole bunch of aerosols, paints, and glazes to produce this kind of metallic rock-like texture and then Grafted onto them is um, kind of Baroque-inspired carnival uh, carnival masks, which are holding the Linda Farrow frames. Um, we were talking a lot about Bonnie Kalura's um, sculptures, where a face is integrated within a kind of topological composition of um, figures. This is the optical trick, so a series of objects um, arrayed around intersecting two-way mirrors or two-way mirrors on an angle. So it as it, it multiplies the presence or the, the presence of the object through reflection. Uh, and then we coated it on the outside with big chunky black foam so that it looks kind of like a geode um, elevation section. So in relation to Foster's choice of the Flavin approach, which reveals the artifice behind the trick, or the Terrell approach, which hides the artifice to produce an uncritical passive reception, our approach here was to produce critical awareness by, in effect, doubling down on intensive experience. More specifically, we layered effects of different orders, um, the intricate physical qualities of the objects that call attention to their concrete uh, thingness through tactility, juxtaposed with the presence of the object as an image devoid of immediate, immediate materiality. Um, so you fluctuate between this uh, kind of um, association with um, the object and then this where it's multiplied uh, ad infinitum uh, as images. In effect this heightens one's awareness of the objects not through revealing their artificiality such as through material indexicality so we didn't reveal how these things were made for example but by changing the order of their immediacy from concrete thing to ghostly trace. Thus, reflexivity is produced by the compound attention brought forth by layering perceptual registers without giving up intensity. Some images of uh, a physical model, which we built as opposed to a digital model, which, which helped us kind of calibrate the optical effects through photography. So last episode is called New Natures. Um, I'll, tr I'll show three projects. Um, in this section, which all relate more or less to um, this book. This is Timothy Morton's Ecology Without Nature, um, which was also, I think, the main one of the main sources of inspiration behind this issue of TARP, um, titled Not Nature. So in broad strokes, Morton's argument is that the concept of nature is actually detrimental to ecological thinking. That if we as a society accept an ontological structure where culture exists on one side of social space, and nature on the other, we create an artificial distance between two realms that ultimately eliminates the possibility of truly coexisting with our material environment. Um, as an example, Morton describes how the logics of sustainability falsely assume that redirecting waste away from buildings takes care of the environmental problem, as if when heat, dirt, or pollution is diverted away from buildings, it goes uh, to some far off place, such as nature, to be purified. Uh, Morton's point is that there is no away. Uh, whoops, sorry. Uh, there is no away. There's no place uh, waste can go to disappear. Even when we regulate the flows of pollution, it is still with us, accumulating in what he calls hyperobjects, which continually affect us in major and minor ways, polluting our air, changing weather pa weather patterns, or seeping into groundwater, for example. 
Morton suggests doing away with the concept of nature altogether, which will eliminate the artificial distance between our buildings and our environment and our bodies and our waste. Ultimately, when nature is taken away, we are left with a radical intimacy with all forms of matter, waste included. For Morton, creating this intimacy is, is an aesthetic problem, a matter of connecting humans to the baser forms of Earth that are typically ironed out of idealized and, and aestheticized images of nature. In Ecology Without Nature, he writes, quote, we should be finding ways to stick around with the sticky mess that we are that we are in and that we are, making thinking dirtier, identifying with ugliness. The broad term, end quote, the broad term Morton gives to this affiliating with dirty matter is dark ecology, which in his book, The Ecological Thought, he describes as, quote, a, a, a weird, perverse aesthetics that includes the ugly uh, and the horrifying embracing the monster, end quote. Um, from the work I've already shown, it's probably not hard to imagine why this definition of dark aesthetics would appeal to me, um, rather than having to explain my work through outdated aesthetic dualities such as beauty and ugliness, Morton offer, offers up ugliness with a purpose. Ugliness is a means of establishing new forms of intimacy between humans and base materiality, which is something I've been after for quite some time. Uh, in the past, I've described the, the material experiments I do as Bataille-inspired downward slips that take glittering detours. In other words, movements from the high to the low that at some point uh, in their fall turn in new directions toward other ends. Um, and ecological intimacy uh, might be one of those ends. So as a starting point, uh, if one considers architecture without nature, uh, which is the title of his article on the issue of TARP, uh, what do you get? So this is the project that actually precedes um, me being familiar with Morton's work. Um, this is a house in Michigan. Uh, the basic idea here is that it's the house is concerned with nature, but there's no privileged ontology of nature which persists th throughout. Um, so the diagram goes like this. There was three types of nature that I was thinking about. One is um, the kind of direct expression of vegetal materiality, which I, I was calling a fur coat, and that's the top image, an abstraction of nature as a graphic. Um, and then second, as, a, as an extension outside of a building, as a, a, as a kind of manicured um, landscape. And then the diagrams on the right are where these um, different expressions of nature were placed in the project. Um, so when you walk in, you get a kind of visceral connection to the physical materiality of the plants, the sort of vegetal facade. Um, this is the section through the entry. You go in and your eyesight is at, at the height of um, the ground plane outside, which is a technique that Frank Lloyd Wright uses often, which produces a kind of experiential connection to the ground plane. You move up into the living room and you look out uh, through a picture window to a kind of manicured landscape outside. And there's a, a abstraction of a graphic um, um, nature, let's say, uh, to your right. Um, and then this is the plan showing the landscape uh, outside. So the idea here is that there's multiple ontologies that are sequenced within one project. Um, the next project I'll, I'll show, um, it's called Other Grounds. It's actually just the installation hover that I showed at the front, uh, taken down and bur buried in my backyard. Um, I had this impulse to uh, put it out into some kind of nat somewhat natural context and just see it decay and weather. Um, so the idea here, and, and then I was as I was reading Morton, this thing was sitting in my backyard, and I started to think about it in slightly different ways. So the way that I wrote about it most recently is a, as a kind of collapsing of ontologies. So there's no ground uh, architecture distinction. There's just one pile of stuff. So steel, polyester, batting, dirt, twigs, and leaves, and they all exist on the same plane. So this thing lived out there for a summer that was as long as my landlord would let me keep it there. And I would periodically go out and take photographs and like put little flowers in it and um, yeah, just see what happened. And this is what I got. So this is, this is the true document. This is uh, what we found one day coming home taped onto our door. This is a notice from the police department of a community standards unit of a code violation. Um, so the store, and it's kind of a good description. Um, it's like, yeah, that's what it is. Cotton polyester batting and metal strung in trees behind the house. Um, 
Yes. So the story, as my neighbor told me after the fact, was that he called the cops because he always walks his dog back there and got freaked out and called the cops. The cops come and they both walk over. The police officer is afraid to touch the thing, so she goes to the uh, to the garage to get a rake, and then they walk back, and she's like poking the thing because obviously it looked like there was dead bodies or something back there. Anyway, uh, that's when I kind of knew that I was maybe on to something. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to end by talking briefly about um, the project in the gallery and the ideas surrounding it. Um, I, I'll make a similar disclaimer to maybe Andrew and Benjamin and say that uh, these are ideas which are very fresh um, and not fully fleshed out, but, but that I'm really excited about. So uh, most recently, I've become increasingly apprehensive with oppositional framings for speculative architecture. That is, the inability to declare something new without referencing, referencing something else of which the new is not. For example, Morton's critique of nature is persuasive, but the ultimate uh, result is, an, is, I think, oppositional and reactionary in the sense that dark ecology needs to be defined negatively as not light ecology. Uh, another example is David Gisson's um, book, Subnature, which is one of the most interesting and provocative books, I think, to come out recently about nature, but still requires the prefix sub, which opposes some other primary term that it is below or underneath. Um, this concept uh, or this concern has led me to consider magical realism as a discursive analog for speculative architecture as opposed to oppositional models such as critical theory. Uh, magical realism, of course, being the primarily literary genre where fantastical elements are inserted into otherwise mundane real contexts. And this is tied to a conversation that I've been having with Andrew Holder and a small group of people at the University of Michigan recently. Um, so as an analog for speculative architecture, I see two main potentials uh, which have to do with its relationship to the real um, and how it compares to critique, uh, and finally how it acts politically. Uh, first, in regards to the real, I'm drawn to the way in which magical realism inserts fantastic things into seemingly real context in a completely deadpan way. When addressing something magical, the narrator rarely acknowledges that, any, that anything out of the ordinary is happening. Um, nor are there lengthy explanations of the laws and logics that govern alternative fictional worlds, which is common in science fiction. Magical realists simply insert strange elements into the real as if they've always, as if they've always been there, as simple matters of fact. To me, this seems like a useful or at least provocative alternative for introducing the strange and new through architecture, because for the most part in today's cultural landscape, extraordinary architecture seems to only enter into culture through the logics of spectacle. Magically new architecture deadpan assert, inserted into the real as simple matters of fact might be a good alternative. In regards to political efficacy, magical realism uh, and critique act differently in relation to the real. So if we understand realism as an attempt to construct a singular universal representation of the natural social of natural social realities, um, Critique would work by exposing the underlying power structures of those realities to show how they oppress and dominate certain members of, of society, all with the aim of human liberation. Magical realism, on the other hand, acts politically, but not through a direct attack on the center, but rather by creating new space on the periphery, space for new types of diversity. Uh, scholar Theo Dehaan calls this writing eccentric, ec eccentrically, which is ex dash centrically, uh, in his account, other literary movements such as naturalism, modernism, or postmodernism work against reality by duplicating it in total according to its own philosophical or theoretical tenets. Magical realism works by appropriating certain aspects of the real and instituting small correctives through magical insertions. Magic appears as, a, as ontological disruptions that correct the culture of the real. So rather than a critical approach to speculative architecture, which would position itself squarely against the status quo, a magical realist approach would weaken the status quo by diluting it through the design of alternatives, creating more options for how to think, act, and behave within the real itself. Uh, returning to this idea of nature, rather than designing dark as opposed to light nature or sub as opposed to primary natures, one might think of simply designing new natures. Um, so this is the project in the gallery. Um, I designed rocks. These are actual rocks. These are new rocks. Uh, in the little wall text uh, next to the piece, 
Um, I talk about three options in the face of an architecture without nature, uh, benign neglect, uh, aestheticized disaster, which I think dark ecology is susceptible to, or thirdly, which might be more the magical realist approach to offer alternatives uh, or to design new natures. Uh, where this work ends, I don't quite know, but my idea of where to start was to free up the qualities of rocks to do new work. Uh, so texture is no longer intrinsic to the material. It is uh, designed and therefore can disobey the rules of organic formation. So it can move um, and change across one rock. Um, it can start to move from a surface articulation to massing. Um, so here, the idea is that the section, the volume in this, within the section is um, an extension of the texture. And then also it can start to act tectonically in the sense that it starts to uh, fit into or inform how it connects to the adjacent pieces. Um, figuration, going back to the faces in the rocks and the artifacts, um, a similar idea where figuration is sort of coincident with surface articulation. So apertures start to group um, and to produce funny little faces where you may, might not expect them. Um, and finally, these are literal rocks, as I said, not representations of rocks, not objects mimicking, mimicking rocks, just rocks. Uh, and to emphasize this, I developed rendering styles um, that would um, sort of emphasize the object in a kind of realist way, uh, as, if, as if I was simply recording their existence. So you get a studio photograph, um, a drawing of the rocks, which is almost a kind of 19th century naturalistic drawing um, and a series of in situ photographs. And that's it. Thanks. <laughs>